God has blessed all of us with money, skills, compassion, encouragement, and energy. And we're supposed to use those resources in order to be an encourager. We're supposed to share that with other people. And one of the things I've learned is that until we learn how to share what God has given to us with other people, then we'll always struggle to find and enjoy God's blessing in our lives. You know, Ruth was saying, I didn't know what I could contribute, what I could make available. But once she made herself available, it was amazing how God was able to work through her and bring so much satisfaction and joy to her life. In the same way, I'm going to read a story from John chapter 6 in just one moment. It's called the feeding of the 5,000. It's the time that Jesus took five loaves of bread and two fish and was able to feed about 13,000 people. It's called the feeding of the 5,000 because that's how many men were present. And this story is recorded in all four Gospels. There's not a lot of stories that are in all four Gospels, but in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it kind of tells a similar story. And in the Gospel of John, which we'll read, it gives us a small nuance that we don't see in the other passages. And in the Gospel of John, the nuance is that the person who brought the five loaves of bread and the two fish was just a young boy who was willing to make the lunch, the, the lunch that his mother made him, he was willing to make that available to God to see what God could do with him. And if he doesn't share what he has with everybody else, maybe this miracle doesn't take place. It says in John 6, after this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. There was a huge crowd that kept following him wherever he went because they saw the miraculous signs he did as he healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed a hill and he sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Soon, a huge crowd of people came looking for Jesus. So turning to Philip, he asked Philip, where can we buy bread to feed all of these people? He was testing Philip because he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, look, even if we worked for months, Jesus, we still wouldn't have enough money to feed all these people. Then Andrew, who was Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. He said, hey, there's a young boy here. He's got five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd of people? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told the disciples, Now I want you to gather up the leftovers so that nothing gets wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. And when the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, Surely this is the prophet that we've been expecting. Now here's the big lesson that I want you to see from this passage. God's blessing comes from sharing what God has given to us with other people. In Acts 20, 35, the Apostle Paul reminded us of the words of the Lord Jesus. He said, even Jesus said, it's far more blessed to give than to receive. I want you to circle that word blessed in your notes. Blessed literally means to be happy. It literally means to be happy. And so what Jesus is saying is you're happier when you're giving than you are when you are getting or receiving. We're all trained the opposite of this when you live in the United States of America. I remember being a young child, Christmas time will roll around, and we get the J.C. Penny wish book in the mail. Boy, you go through circling all the stuff you wanted, right? Then, man, if I could just get this, then I would be happy. And then you got to learn in life the hard way. It doesn't matter what you get, it's never enough. Amen? You know what I'm talking about? Like, you ever wanted something, you get it, and it really didn't do much. And the more you get, the more you want, right? Getting Never satisfied. This is why your kids, you sacrifice, you give to them for Christmas. They get everything they ever wanted, and somebody comes over, and they say, would you give me? Because it's never enough. We always want more. And what Jesus is saying is that really the pathway to happiness is not in getting. It's in giving and sharing what we have. Everybody wants to receive God's blessings, but many people are not willing to do what it takes to prepare themselves to receive the fullness of God's blessing for them. And the way you prepare yourself is by becoming generous and sharing in what you have and giving to others. This is an important part of the principles that God gives us. Even people you don't like, 
Even people that you find difficult to be with in your life, even the people you struggle with, the best thing you could do is give to them. And so often we try to take from them thinking that that's going to satisfy in some way. I was reading about this online about a lady who went to church. And when she went to church, they were collecting the offering. And when she went to pull the envelope out of her purse, a remote control fell out and hit the floor. And the usher was surprised. He said, what are you doing bringing a remote control to church? She said, well, I really wanted my husband to come with me today, but he wouldn't come, so I figured this is the best way for me to get back at him. See, she thought, man, I could take from him because he ain't doing what I wanted. And we can all relate to that. But what I really want to explain is, what does it take to really enjoy and experience God's blessing in our lives? You're taking notes, filling in the blanks is where we're starting. Experiencing God's blessing requires looking out for the test. Looking out for the test. The Lord is often testing us faith and trust we have in him. The people started coming up, and so the Lord asked Philip, Philip, where are we going to buy enough bread to feed all of these people? And Philip didn't realize that the Lord was testing him. See, the Lord knew that the disciples were fishermen and tax collectors. He knew good and well none of them had been caterers before they met the Lord. It wasn't up to them to solve the food crisis. That's not what he was looking for. He was just testing them. In John 6, 5 and 6 says, Jesus saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. So he turned to Philip and he said, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was just testing Philip because Jesus already knew what he was going to do. I like taking tests. I'm good at taking tests. I hated homework, but I like the test because I could study, remember stuff. I got it, boom, without doing any homework. I could show up and get me a C. Amen? <laughs> My favorite test, though, is the mental health test. I love this test. Y'all want to take it today? It's easy, right? We know statistically that one out of every four people in the United States has a mental imbalance. So you just think about your three closest friends. If they all straight, you the one. <laughs> now the Lord tests us, you see. One of the ways the Lord tests us is he tests our faith to see if he can develop us. He tests our faith in order to develop us. In James 1, 3 through 4, it says, you should know that when your faith is tested. Let's say that word tested together on three. One, two, three. Tested. When your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. Because when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. The Lord tests us. Reminds me of a quote by the great boxer, Joe Frazier. He said, champions aren't made in the ring. They're merely recognized there. What you cheat on under the early morning light will be exposed in the bright lights of the ring when the test happens. See, what Joe Frazier was talking about is there's a difference between the training and the test. The Lord tests us. Now, when we go to church, this is training. When you read your Bible, that's training. When you go to life group, that's training. When you pray, you're training. But that's not the same as the test. It's like the New Orleans Saints, right? Every year they go to training camp. And you know what happens when they get to training camp. What's the writer say? The offense looks amazing. The defense looks ferocious. The special teams look spectacular. But then they get the test, which is playing in the games. <laughs> and all of a sudden, offense don't look as good as it looked in training camp. And the defense got a few holes, and the special teams not so spectacular, right? The test is different than training. And there's no different in life. We all go through different training. But that's not the same as the test. And Jesus tests us from time to time. It reminds me of another boxer, Mike Tyson, who said everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> right? Because that's the test, right? You can do all the training, but the test is when you get punched in the face. And that's what happens to our faith. Everybody says, oh, my faith is strong until they get punched in the face by cancer. Everybody says, oh, my faith is strong until you get uppercutted by marriage problems. Oh, my faith is strong until they start making cutbacks at work and you get a left jab right to the eye. All of a sudden, you start realizing that our faith gets tested, and we get punched in the face sometimes, and we got to realize what's our faith really made of. All of a sudden, we get hit with hurt and rejection and disappointment and depression and discouragement. These things start lighting us up, and then we find out what our faith is made of. And this is what most Christians do. When they find themselves in the test, getting punched in the face, they want to run from it and avoid it. But what I'm telling you is embrace 
the test. Because the tests of our faith is what Jesus uses to develop us. James said this, man, when your faith is tested, then your endurance can be developed. Then you can grow and back in nothing. When you find yourself facing tests in your faith, receive them and say, thank you, Jesus. I know you're using it in order to develop me. The test has value. Embrace the test. Then the Lord also tests our fears to see if we can stay focused on him. In Matthew 14, Jesus spoke to them when he was walking on water. And he said, don't be afraid. They were in the midst of a storm. Take courage because I am here. And then Peter cried out and said, Lord, call me to walk out on the water. I want to walk out on the water. And when Peter got out there, he was doing good as long as his focus was on Jesus. But then he got distracted by the winds and the waves and the circumstances. Fear started to creep in and he started to sink. Every one of us knows what it's like to face fear. I remember one day my wife called me. It was a Wednesday night. I was at church at our airline campus. I was there ministering. She called me. I could hear the fear and the panic in her voice. She said, man, you got to get home immediately. I'm starting to panic. Baby, what's wrong? Flying roach in the house. <laughs> Immediate fear, right? And she got to stay on the phone with me the whole way I'm home, giving me play by play. Right. He's on the wall. He's on the ceiling now. He just flew across the room. You got to hurry. <laughs> now, nah, a roach can't bite. A roach ain't poisonous. This isn't a king cobra. This ain't a water moccasin. It's not a brown recluse spider. This ain't a mountain lion or a grizzly bear. It's just a roach. Roach ain't got no special powers except for they can move quickly in different directions and they harder to kill than Steven Seagal. That's it, right? <laughs> I've even had people say, Pastor, I don't understand why God made roaches. I'll tell you why. Roaches are there to remind us that even something we can overpower just by stepping on can cause fear in our lives. And if what we can overpower can cause fear, imagine how much fear can hit us when it's something we have no control over. The fear of disappointment, the fear of getting rejected, the fear of being hurt, the fear of success, the fear of failure. All these fears can creep in. And what fear does is it moves our focus from Jesus onto our circumstances. And the Lord tests us. He tests our fears sometimes to see if we can stay focused on him. The Lord tests us in our fears. And then the Lord tests our finances to see if we really trust him. The Lord blesses us. He gives generously to us because he wants to see if we're really going to be willing to share what we have and give what we have to others, knowing that God can keep on providing for us. There's passages in the Bible that talk about how the Lord tests us in our finances. I want to encourage you, read the book of Haggai, chapter 1. You might even know they got a book named Haggai. It's in the Old Testament, a little small book. And chapter 1 is all about how the Lord was testing his people because they were so busy just spending their money on themselves, they had neglected the kingdom and the house of God. In verse 9 in the book of Haggai, the Lord says, You hoped for rich harvest, but they were poor. And when you brought your harvest home, I blew it away. Why? Because my house lies in ruins, says the Lord of Heaven's armies, while you're all busy building your own fine houses. The Lord tests us in our finances to see if we really trust in him. Let me ask you, in what areas of your life has the Lord been testing you? What are the tests the Lord has been putting you through? Not only does experience in God's blessing require looking out for the test, it also requires seeing things from the supernatural perspective. Seeing things from the supernatural. In John 6, 7, Peter replied to Jesus, even if we work for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed all these people. Well, this is interesting. Jesus didn't say, do you have enough money to feed these people? He said, where can we buy bread? But Philip took it on his own to say, Lord, you out your mind. We don't have that much money. I checked the bag. There's not that many resources. Now, was Philip wrong? No, technically he wasn't wrong. He was technically right. They didn't have enough money to feed all those people. But Philip's problem was not that he wasn't technically right. It's that he was seeing things from the natural perspective. The natural lens says, given all of my resources and my abilities, given my current circumstances, which solutions can I come up with? And Philip said, Lord, this isn't a solvable problem. But the problem was that he was looking at it from the natural lens. Jesus doesn't look at things from the natural lens. His natural perspective is the supernatural lens, greater than the natural. When God looks at a problem, God says, well, given my resources, given my abilities, given what I have available to me, what can I make happen in this situation based on my perspective? And as a Christian, what we need to learn to do is to take off the natural lens and start seeing things the way God sees them from the supernatural lens. Now, there's all kind of examples of this in the Bible. One of my favorites is from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 16. 
the priest, the prophet Samuel, was supposed to anoint the next king of Israel. And he knew that it was one of the sons of Jesse, but he didn't know which son. So when he shows up, Jesse's first son, Eliab, comes out, and he just looks like a king. So Samuel assumed that was him. In 1 Samuel 16, it says, when they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way that you see them. He's got a different perspective, a different lens, a different angle, a different way he's looking at it. Now, Philip should have known better. In John chapter 2, Philip was with Jesus when he turned water into wine, and Mary said, just do whatever Jesus tells you. He should have known the test was coming, and when the test came, he should have said, Jesus, you know good and well. We don't have no ability to solve this problem on our own. We need you to tell us what to do. Jesus was just testing Philip to see if Philip would rely on Jesus or if he would try to count in his own strength and ability. Every Christian should operate in the Lord's strength, ability, and resources. This is why in John 14, Jesus said, if you follow me, you're going to do as good a work as I've done. You've done even greater works because you're going to lean on me and my resources. Philip saw his own limitations, his own abilities, and he just simply thought, there's no other option. We're out of options. I promise you this. Whenever you find yourself in a hopeless situation, it's because you're relying on your own strength and ability. Hopelessness is always a sign of self-reliance. You got to experience turning everything over to Jesus, saying, Jesus, I got nothing in this situation. I don't have any ability. I don't have any resources. I don't have what it takes. I just need to turn it over to you and let you show up. And you tell me what to do because I can't solve this problem on my own. What are the hopeless situations that you currently see in your life? Here's the third thing we learn from this passage about experiencing God's blessing. It requires making what we have available to God. In John 6, verses 8 and 9, it says, Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. He says, There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish, but what good is that to this huge crowd? You think about this. What was the young boy's name? We don't know. A nameless young boy got a lunch his mama packed him. He probably had my wife as his mama because she the kind that would pack five loaves of bread and two fish for just one son. She'd probably say, just in case nobody else got nothing to eat, take a little extra you could share with them, you know? And here he is, and he's got this little bit that he's got to offer, and all he's willing to do is say, you know what? I'm willing to make what I have available to Jesus. I'm willing to make it available to him. It might have seemed insignificant. Even Andrew, Philip was doubting. Andrew's doubting too. Andrew says, man, what good is five loaves of bread and two fish to a crowd this size? He ain't going to solve that problem. I mean, you think about it. If you take five loaves of bread and two fish and you divide it up by 5,000 men, what you got? 5,000 hungry men, right? You, be like, you get one scale of fish and you get a morsel of bread, right? You divide it all up, it don't make no sense. You think about it. It made more sense from the natural perspective for the young boy just to keep it for him and his family. And say, at least we won't be hungry. The rest of y'all got to fend for yourselves, right? At least we'll be taken care of. Well, think about this. He says, you know what? I'm going to give it to Jesus. I'm going to let him do what he can with it. I'm willing to put it into his hands. Because what we get focused on is how are we going to divide what we have and spread it out amongst everybody and make a dent. But Jesus wasn't thinking division. Jesus was thinking multiplication. I can take what you give and I can multiply it to take care of everybody that is here. We often think that what we have is not enough for God to use, but we don't realize that God can supernaturally multiply whatever we make available to him. We see this in the scripture. When God called Moses to lead the Israelites free from the slavery of the Egyptians, Moses didn't think he could do it because he was looking at his own strength and ability. When God called Gideon to step up and to lead his clan and his family, Gideon thought, man, I can't possibly do this in my own strength and ability. And then we see Isaiah. Isaiah said, you know what? Here I am, Lord. Just send me. And that needs to be our perspective. Our perspective needs to be, you know what? I'm willing to take whatever I have and make it available to God. And here's the problem we run into. We think that what we bring to the table is not significant enough for God to use. 
We think what we have to offer couldn't possibly make a dent in solving this uh, problem. We think that what we have is not enough to do anything, so we just hold it back and we don't make it available to the Lord. But the Lord is looking for people who are willing to take everything they have and make it available to him. Think about this. This passage says that there was 5,000 men who were present. Now, I don't know if you picked this up or not, but in those days, women and children were not included in the count. Well, let me say it a different way. Women and children didn't count, so nobody even bothered counting them. So here's a young man. He wasn't even in the 5,000. He was just a young boy on the sidelines, but he was willing to say, you know what, I'll take what I have and just make it available to you. Can I tell you, many of you today, you think that what you have is insignificant or you don't count or what you don't have is going to make an impact or a difference. But I'm telling you, God wants you to step up. Many of you, you need to use your communication card to sign up to start volunteering here in the church. Not because we're desperate for more volunteers, but because you need to do that. You need to step up and make what you have available to God and say, you know what? I'm willing to just put this out there and whatever Jesus can do with it, so be it. I'll put it in his hands and hope he can make something happen. Every single one of us, every one of us is faced with that dilemma, that problem, that challenge. Are we willing to take what we have and make it available to God for him to use? Jesus can do some miraculous things when you just make what you have available to him. Here's the last thing I want you to see. Experiencing God's blessing requires getting things in order. It takes getting things in order. It's interesting, before Jesus performs the miracle, he first requires that the people get organized and in order. Here in John, he told everybody to sit down. In Mark's version, he gives us some more specifics. It says Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups, and they sat down in groups of 50 and 100. Now, isn't it interesting that Jesus makes them get organized before he performs the miracle? What's the reason for that? Here's the reason. God is not going to waste his blessings on people who have not gotten their lives in order. You ever ask, had somebody ask you to borrow, borrow some money, but you knew good and well the reason they had financial problems is because they was disorganized in how they managed their money? Were you feeling confident, like this is people I should give this money to? Then why do you think God would look at us? Look at how we manage our lives. We ain't got nothing in order, and all of a sudden we think, He's going to bless us when we can't even manage what we already have. 1 Corinthians 14, 33, God is not a God of disorder, but is peace, as in all the meetings of God's holy people. God is looking for people who are orderly and organized and got their affairs and what they're responsible to manage in order. I remember I was uh, at a conference, and there was a pastor in Baton Rouge named Larry Stockstill, and he was teaching, and he said, you know what? I know a lot of pastors that are praying God blesses them with a big church to lead but they can't keep their closet organized or their garage in order and their car is a mess. If you can't keep your garage or your closet or your car in order, why would you think God would give you a big church to keep in order? Well, I thought, man, if there ain't some great insight in that. If you can't keep your finances in order with the little bit you got, why are you praying for God to give you more money? If you can't manage the workload that you currently have, why would God bless you with a promotion? If you can't manage the situation you find yourself in, why all of a sudden do you think that God would bless you with more responsibility, knowing good and well you couldn't possibly handle that blessing? The key to preparing yourself to get your blessings in order is to get your life in order with what you have right now. I remember after I heard Larry Stockstill say that, one night I was sleeping and I had a dream. And my dream was that his car broke down on I-10. And he showed up at my house and he needed to borrow my car. And my car was a mess. And I thought, oh, no, Lord, I can't let him see my car because then he's going to know my life's in disorder and disarray. Can I just tell you, from time to time, you need to wake up and smell the coffee and look at your life and realize things ain't in the proper order. It's time to get organized. It's time to get orderly. Jesus said, before I do this miracle, y'all better sit down in groups of 50 and 100. I wonder if they was like, nah, we're just going to run free. If Jesus would have been like, and you're going to be hungry, too. Because in life, we got to get things in order from time to time. What's some things you need to get in order in your life? What's some things you need to get organized in your life? Here's the last thing I want to show you in this passage, John 6, 11 through 13. It says they ate all, all ate as much as they wanted. And after everyone was filled, Jesus took his disciples, 
And he said, now I want you to gather the leftovers and make sure that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled the 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. It's interesting. Jesus is so concerned with the way we manage our resources that he made his disciples gather up the leftovers because he didn't want anything to go to waste. Now, he started with five loaves of bread and two fish, but when he got to the end, they had all kind of leftovers, and Jesus said, gather them up. Now, think about this. Who likes leftovers? No, but you don't like leftovers. You like the real thing. Nobody wants leftovers. Come on, you know if you opened up a restaurant, leftovers catering. Ain't nobody coming. I read online, it said, the best way to serve leftovers is to somebody else. But here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus said, you know what? Let's gather up the leftovers. You know what he calls it? Scraps. Let's gather up the leftover scraps. Now, how many baskets of leftover scraps did they gather in this passage? Did you see it? Twelve. What should that number remind you of? The 12 faithless disciples, right, that were doubting and couldn't believe. And it was like Jesus is saying, you know what? I got a basket left over for each one of you fools to take home as a reminder. <laughs> but I think that there's some symbology here we need to take note of. I think that what Jesus is saying is that even if you think you're just a leftover scrap, I still can do something with you. I still can use you in my hands. I still can multiply that. That's still useful to me because I want to make sure that nothing, nobody's gift, nobody's talent, nobody's skill, nobody's compassion, nobody's encouragement, nothing you're bringing to the table gets left over and unused or gets wasted. Everybody's got value when it comes to my hands. I just need you to make yourself available to what I'm trying to do. Amen? Amen. That's what I want you to do. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. This is the most important part of the service right here. I want you to pray out loud with me. I want you to say, dear Lord Jesus, what are you saying to me from today's message? What do I have that you want me to make available to you? My heart is open. My life is open. I submit and surrender everything into your hands. Make me like the young boy who took what he had and was willing to share it with other people. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's all stand together. I'm going to invite our prayer leaders who are available here today to come to the front to be available.